Okay, I want to welcome everyone back. Remember, this is going to be our only screencast for Chapter 12. In fact, it's our last screencast for third quarter. So in Chapter 12, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tie everything together from Sections 12.1, 12.2 and 12.3. And so what I've done is I've sort of taken out what I feel are the most important pieces from each of these sections. And so in this particular screencast we're going to focus on the structure of DNA and how that DNA is replicated. Now before we can actually get started talking about structure or replication we need to understand the roles of DNA. And there's going to be three of those. Now here it says the DNA that makes up the genes must be capable of three primary things. Now remember we've already used the term genes in a previous chapter. Remember in chapter 11 we talked about those genes as being those factors that can be used to transmit information to the next generation. Well within those genes we have a material called DNA. And that DNA is being used to store information, it's being used to copy information, and then we need to be able to take that copied information and transmit or transfer it to the next generation. So those would be the three roles of DNA. Now what your textbook does is it actually relates the three roles to a book. And so if you look down here, this book right here would represent the storing aspect of DNA. In other words, there's lots of information stored in this book. Now, of course, we want to make sure others can enjoy the book. So what we're going to do is we're going to copy this information. All right. And so once we've copied that information, we're going to transmit that information to other areas, maybe other libraries, so other people can enjoy that information as well. So what you see down here is very similar to what DNA can do inside of a living cell. Now when you think about DNA, you need to think about DNA as being what we consider a macromolecule or a nucleic acid. And we had talked about nucleic acids back in chapter 2. Now DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. Right? And since it is considered a macromolecule, we're talking about a material that is considered a polymer. So remember a polymer is going to be a long strand or chain of material. Now that long chain is going to be made up of very small individual units. And in this case, DNA is going to be made up of small units called nucleotides. And these nucleotides are going to be joined together, held together, by covalent bonds. Now there's three basic components of a nucleotide. We have a nitrogen base. And these are the colored nitrogen bases that you see right here. And there's going to be four different types of nitrogen bases, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. We have actually a sugar, and that is what deoxyribose stands for. We have the word ribose in here, and so that's going to represent a sugar. And in this case, we have a five-carbon sugar, because we have one, two, three, four, five. It's a pentagon shape. And then we have a phosphate group, and that's what these blue spheres at the bottom stand for. And so each one of these, so this right here, would be considered a nucleotide. All right, so we actually have four nucleotides here. And these four nucleotides are being joined together by an alternating sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate type of arrangements. And again, those um, connections are going to be made by a covalent bond between each of those nucleotides. Now, thinking about the structure of DNA, um, we have a special person by the name of Erwin Shargaff who actually, after his study of DNA, had actually discovered that those nitrogen bases that we had just mentioned, the adenine, the thymine, the guanine, and the cytosine, they arrange themselves in a certain way. And the way that he did that is he actually looked at several samples of DNA from different organisms. Um, we would be one of those organisms that you see right here. I believe this is going to be a fruit fly. I think this is corn. And then down here towards the bottom, we have a couple of different types of bacteria. So what he had noticed was that when he analyzed the samples of DNA, and he looked specifically at the amounts of adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, he had found that the amounts of adenine, for example, for humans, was 31% and thymine was 31.5, so they were very similar to each other. And then when he looked at the guanine and the cytosine, guanine was 19.1%, cytosine 18.4. So again, two numbers very close to each other. And so what he had concluded based on his studies was that adenine must pair with thymine, and guanine 
must pair with cytosine. And so this became known as basic Chargaff's rules. All right, And that's going to be really important when it comes down to that um, double helix nature that we're going to look at in just a second on how that DNA is put together. So in addition to the information that was gathered by Erwin Chargaff in regards to base pairing, we also had a scientist by the name of Rosalind Franklin that was actively working on the structure of the DNA molecule as well. Now she was a scientist during the early 1950s and she used a special process called x-ray diffraction. And from that x-ray diffraction she was able to take a picture, and you can see that picture over here on the right hand side, of the DNA molecule itself. Now that diffraction had revealed to her sort of an X-shaped pattern. Now that pattern indicated to Rosalind Franklin that DNA was actually made up of two strands. And those two strands were simply twisted around each other very much like the coils of a spring. Now at the same time we also had two additional scientists, James Watson and Francis Crick, that were doing their best to build their own 3D model of the DNA molecule as well. And what they did is they actually used information from Rosalind Franklin to finally come up with the idea that DNA is actually a double helix. And so over here on the right you can see this example of the DNA molecule. And so what I want you guys to gather from this is we actually have two strands of this molecule sort of wrapped around each other. And the way that you see these two strands put together, this is what we would refer to as the double helix structure of DNA. And so what we have on the outside is, right along here is we have those sugar phosphates, sugar phosphates that we had talked about earlier on in the screencast, and in the middle we have those nitrogen bases that are basically holding those two strands together. And so based on Erwin Chargaff's base pairing rule, if we have a guanine here, over here we would have a cytosine and if we have an adenine here then that means right here we would have a thymine. So all of those pieces put together gave us that double helix. So the final piece that we need to talk about is we need to talk about the replication process in DNA. And when we say replication, we're simply discussing the idea that this DNA must be copied. Now remember back at the beginning of the screencast, we had said that there are three primary roles for DNA. We need to store the information, we need to copy the information, and we also need to be able to transmit the information. And so in this case, we're looking at how is that information actually copied. So the goal is to produce two new complementary strands. And we're going to follow the idea of base pairing. And that base pairing rule was established by Erwin Chargaff. Now it's important to realize that each original strand of the double helix is going to serve as a template or a model for the new strand that we're trying to build. Now down here towards the bottom what we've done is we've untwisted the double helix and right now it sort of looks like a ladder and in the middle you'll notice these are going to be considered the rungs of the ladder. And so again based on Erwin Chargaff's rules of base pairing remember that A always pairs with T and C always pairs with G. So what's going to happen is these two strands are going to unzip and when they unzip each side of the strand is going to act as that template. So as new bases are added to each side, again the template is going to be the guide. So if we have a G on this side, then of course we need to make sure we add a C. If we have a T, we need to make sure we add the A. And so over here on the right you can notice that we actually produce in the end two exact copies of that information. Now you'll notice the blue is going to represent our original strand and the red is going to represent our new strand. So when you think about it, each new strand of DNA always has an original and always has a new strand. Now there's actually a lot of chemistry that's involved when you talk about the replication process of DNA, but we're going to make this relatively simple and we're simply going to focus on two of the primary enzymes. And the first one is the enzyme that is used to actually separate or unzip that double helix strand and that enzyme is called helicase. Now if you look down here towards the bottom we have an example of how DNA replication occurs and this right here would represent our original DNA strand. In other words we haven't really done anything to this strand quite yet. Now helicase, the special enzyme, is going to come through and it's going to unzip this strand so replication can occur. Now the way it's going to do this is the hydrogen bonds that are actually holding the nitrogen bases together, in other words connecting these two strands, 
are going to be broken, and that's the main function of helicase. Now, if you notice in the diagram, the different colors represent the different types of nitrogen bonds. Now, the new strands that will form, in other words, when we create that brand new strand of DNA, there's a special enzyme that does that as well, and it's called DNA polymerase, and its primary job is to add the new bases. So again, looking down here towards the bottom, if you notice, once we unzip this strand, we end up with what we call an original strand. In other words, that's our template strand. That's our model that we're going to go from. So if you notice, we have an original strand over here, and of course, this could be considered an original strand as well. Now, the DNA polymerase is going to come through, and what you see here is simply it is adding nitrogen bases. It's adding that complementary nitrogen base. In other words, that base that will fit perfectly with what is on that template strand. So if you notice, the red that you see right here is going to represent the guanine. So as the DNA polymerase comes through, it's going to add a cytosine based on Shargaff's base pairing rules. And if you notice, this green right here is representing an adenine. So it's going to come through the DNA polymerase, and it's going to add a thymine here. And then it continues that through until the two brand new strands have been created. Now, in addition to adding the new bases, DNA polymerase will also proofread and make sure that there are absolutely no mistakes in the replication process. And if there are mistakes, it will quickly correct those mistakes before the process has completed. Okay, so that's going to finish up our first and only screencast for Chapter 12. Now, as I had said before, what I've done is I've taken the information that I felt was really important from 12.1, 12.2, and 12.3, and I've condensed it into this one video. So it's really important that you make sure that you complete your screencast notes before you come to class.